Hi everyone. In a practical sense, how should you relate to the trickster function? How do you recognise it when it arises? How does it regulate homeostasis? How is it connected to the shadow and to the anima? All of these questions and much more are answered in today's video, taken from a recent high level second and third year IPSA professional training seminar hosted by Steve and Pauline Richards. The context is thus. A student raised the character of Dominic Magister from Steve and Pauline's Oxford's Blues trilogy. A true Jungian psychodrama of individuation, which we have available to pick up from jungtoliveby.com if you'd like to explore it for yourself. In the story, Dominic Magister is a representation of the trickster function and the so-called dark side of the self in Jungian terms, as well as personifying and demonstrating a multitude of relational psychodynamics as an integral part of this genuine psychodrama. Without spoiling anything, several characters find themselves, unconsciously, drawn under his influence and control. So long as they do as he says, and continue to amuse him, he makes sure that they are held in a pseudo-homeostasis, well out of balance with themselves, but not completely destroyed. That is, until he simply gets bored of them. The student asks Stephen Pauline about how this real dynamic pertaining to the trickster function operates in real life. An individual can sometimes get themselves into a situation where they have to feed the trickster continually in order to avoid being thrown completely out of homeostasis with themselves. What does this look like? And what can the person do? Uh, that's a good question. It's, all, it's about the quality or quality of information that the trickster represents. It's, it's inflationary by its nature. And it's inflationary by its nature because it can move so easily from individual to psychosocial representation. And it does so because it's a regulatory dynamic that can operate for a group as much as for an individual. So it, it morphs very easily. It changes from one level, you know, the individual level of registration to the other. The usual way of regulating the trickster is through humour. And we do that in a group via the medium of comedians, because comedians act for us to deliver the message of the trickster and to earth its energy. However, they pay very often with the very high price of falling victim to the inflation of the trickster who then turns on them. Uh, so many comedians have are, are mental illness problems, addiction problems, that kind of thing. Um, and that's partly a process of being under the pressure to reproduce the trickster, to literally generate it, to animate others. That comes at terrific cost. A lot of uh, comedians get depression, for example, but it helps. It helps the culture as a whole to have comedians. Uh, and when a culture starts to suppress comedy, then we know there's a problem, of course, because the trickster is going to find its way out somehow. Uh, and that is that it gets really dangerous at that point. So comedy is always used for that, that purpose. So it's something to do with the quality of that which it represents, uh, how the energy and the information bunches together, and its purpose in moving things around. It's almost not human, but it's infectious at the same time. And that, I think, is why uh, the kinds of reifications form around the image of tricksters, such as clowns called jesters, feriomorphs, part human, part animal guides, uh, and all the various uh, bandwidth representations of that. And of course, also how it links with Jung's shadow and the anima as well. They're all to do with relating all of those things, the distillations of relating, which get co-opted or co-opt itself or themselves the trickster so we have this this kind of amorphous thing which which represents different uh, elements but they're really the same so the trickster is a, a version of the relating function which has a specific purpose um 
And when someone's in the grip of it individually, they feel humour. And humour's good because we get a release of reward in terms of a hormonal state. But then the consequences of that hormonal state are almost separated from being in it. And that's when we can hurt others. And it might appear later, well, I said that I didn't mean to, or I did something and I didn't mean to. And it hurt that person, but it's actually worked out okay because that person's adjusted in some way. But I'm left with the feeling that I've done that to them. And then did I do it or was it something else? And then you, you know, you and then you forget and you get on with your life. That shows the trickster's autonomous, that it, it's attempts to regulate individuals sometimes by third parties, and sometimes enter into a, a group dynamic as well. Um, and it can become malevolent at its extreme. Early on, its manifestation is more likely to be like a psychopomp, but it is actually the same thing, just dialed down a bit. Lots of psychopomps have trickster-like qualities, but they're not full-blown. Uh, when the, 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 the trickster function really ramps up, it, it's no longer directly reified and it becomes... Um, First of all, synchronicities, as you know, ramp up. And then you, you can get full-blown paranormal parapsychological phenomenon. And uh, that is interesting because we could model that as being a, a representation of the field itself acting autonomously without direct human instantiation. That's why it appears to be paranormal. But the human beings are part of the field. Usually with poltergeist, for example, if you can find the significant individual around which this is focused, and work with them, the poltergeist phenomenon disappears. So it shows that humans are involved, but the expression of it appears to be not within the person, but within the environment. It's a field phenomenon. And that's why it's difficult to understand if we take a reductive scientific approach to it, and we're looking for you know Newtonian physics or whatever. It doesn't appear to obey those kinds of laws at all. It's getting more into the kind of thing that Jung and Pauli would have looked at. So all of these things are related. It's a case of the resolution of focus of the phenomenon and then what it's trying to regulate. And by regulate, I mean homeostasis. Homeostasis is, if you like, the, the concept of survival. Biological homeostasis is concerned with physical survival. Psychosocial homeostasis is concerned with behavioral elements of survival interactively. But it's the same thing in superposition. So even when the trickster's at work, then that's part of homeostasis. But it might be serving the register, if you like, of collective survival. So it'll make the clown do something stupid and sacrifice themselves, for example. But the group yeah. benefit. So there's some resonance in a field sense between the genome of the group, the genomes, that say one of us is going to have to cop for this. Who's going to be the instantiation of the trickster and do the stupid thing that saves us all? And usually one person will just find themselves doing it. And it might be out of character that they're aware of, of their character, but the regulating dynamic has selected them and they go and do it. Or the regulating dynamic in, might say, you will instantiate the trickster and find a novel solution to the problem that's affecting all of us. But don't identify with it beyond the point at which, you know, you have been chosen to operate, because if you do that, it will turn on you because you're not meant to instantiate it continuously. You're human. That is contra homeostasis if you take it too far, so it acts against you. I say comedians run that risk all the time because they're operating at such a collective level. They may not fully articulate it in that way in terms of understanding, but they compensate for an entire culture. They compensate against power in the form of politics. They compensate for instincts and joke about them. Hence all these sex jokes you get with comedians. That's Freud coming through the trickster's manipulating freud and the expression of libido but if it's all going out and there's no boundary the comedian then will suffer afterwards a depletion of their own libido and become maybe depressed or anxious because they feel the pressure of it coming through it's a very difficult thing i think to be a comedian so, so what happens in the culture when humor goes woke do you think oh yeah well when, when humor goes woke there'll be a period mm. of suppression of spirit as Jung would have understood it, and then there'll be an instinctive push to compensate for that. And the trickster will appear in a malevolent form that will turn on people right, left, and centre. Uh, and I mean that politically, right, left, and centre. It will turn on everyone to, to generate a, a systems collapse 
that will mean there'll be an anti-adroma and a reformulation of, of the political, the power, the Adlerian level, in order to allow instinct to, to express itself. Because at that point, when humour is repressed by the culture, then the culture is sick. Uh, and it's also a Jungian inflation too, because whoever's pulling those strings think themselves to, to quote uh, Crazy Horse to be, you know, important, when really they're nothing. They're just individuals, nevertheless, who, who have uh, risen to prominence in a powerful sense and then inflated, which is why leaders should be changed regularly, like underpants, you know? <laughs> I think the tricks okay. are... <laughs> <What's that? laughs> oh okay that's very interesting yeah the um the it's oh, it, about the oh sorry sorry what was that? i was being very rude and I, I said he does have some ball of an underpants somewhere <laughs> oh dear find them i think he thought he was wearing them because of what he said but apparently not yeah, you've got to be really careful with things yeah. like that yeah. Really, really careful because it, it just turns on you. You know, if you, yeah. if you push it too far, it turns on you. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's interesting. The the, the qualitative um, aspect of the information that's being processed and communicated and exchanged with that, and the intentionality behind it, that that seems um, just as you said to to really fit in with what you're what you elaborated on. Um, both in terms of an individual's context, but it could also be to do with the, the wider informational field as well, which yeah. is where the lines kind of start to blur. Yeah. That's very interesting. If, if you have a totalitarian society, but that's only really at the top level. And then if you can kind of imagine like little lines drawn down from the top towards the bottom, so it penetrates every layer towards the bottom, but those lines are thin. So there's a loss of control, but it's displaced in the gaps people can still full, uh, function culturally and they preserve the culture in those gaps. Outside of it, they're heavily regulated, they're regulated at the top all the way down. But there's something that, that can sustain itself for a long time, provided those gaps are wide enough to give continuity of culture so that people feel they're resisting, even though they're not completely free. So a clever totalitarian system will operate like that. It won't try and do a complete suppression. It will do, an, a, like I say, like a, a lined one from the top to the bottom, like bars that will leave some gaps for, for freedom. Uh, and, and people will form subcultures within those gaps. But if you try and suppress the whole thing, it's going to go. It will definitely go.